At the October 2020 iPhone 12 keynote, Apple announced a feature that they only touched on briefly, but it was a feature that a lot of longtime Apple users, myself included, got very excited about. A feature called MagSafe. Basically a ring of magnets at the back of iPhone 12 that would enable this handy wireless charging puck, cases, and other accessories. The implications of MagSafe are massive, but I believe that I've discovered why Apple, well, they just didn't spend that much time on it in the keynote. And that's because it, uh, well, it has some problems. Charge your new iPhone, MagSafe or not, and a flurry of other devices using RAV Power's excellent gallium nitride 65 watt four device intelligent charger. Get yours today with the link below or stay tuned to later in the video to learn more. You see the name MagSafe, it isn't new. iPhone 12's MagSafe Reincarnate originally debuted on the 2006 MacBook Pro, Apple's first Intel-based Mac laptop. The original pitch for the magnetic connector was a really simple one. Because the MagSafe connector is a new power adapter that we've got with a connect new connector that's magnetically held in, and if when the cord gets yanked, it just pulls right off. The original MagSafe was one of those classic Apple features where it seems a little bit silly at first, but it quickly proves itself to be an instant hit. <laughs> and it was really just a serious quality of life improvement. Not only did it protect the laptop from falling, but it also had other added benefits. It proved itself a more convenient, more durable, and reversible alternative to the classic barrel plug connector. The death of MagSafe began with the introduction of the 2015 12-inch MacBook with its single USB-C port for data and charging. There just, there wasn't enough room to justify placing a power-only magnetic port on such a thin and light laptop. Especially when USB-C, while brand new at the time, was believed to be the future universal connector. And it, well, it, it kind of is. MagSafe for iPhone is certainly an homage to the beloved connector of yore, but these two MagSafe connectors are similar in name only. Most notably, the new MagSafe connector well, it has a ring of magnets that are frankly just too strong for the connector to easily detach from your phone. Trip on your MagSafe connector cable while it's attached to your iPhone, and well, your iPhone's going with it. But that's probably okay, right? Because the iPhone isn't a MacBook, they're usually in a case, and if they do fall, well, they're more likely to be okay than a laptop. But then the question is asked, so why the heck does MagSafe exist? Well, it'd be easy to blame Apple's failed air-powered charging mat that embarrassingly never shipped despite its public unveiling. And while I'm near certain that MagSafe's development was inspired by AirPower's failure, I think it's more intricate than, well, this thing exists because this thing failed. It's no secret that Apple has been hesitant, nay, purposely laggard, in adopting USB-C on the iPhone especially since it's one of the few devices that Apple still sells uh, without the Type-C connector installed. On the offset, it may seem kind of surprising given that Apple has been one of USB-C's greatest purveyors. But on the other hand, it makes a lot of sense and I think there are multiple reasons. So let's start with the cynical one and that's money, a lot of freaking money. Apple's lightning port that has been in use since the iPhone 5 is part of a program called MFI or made for iPhone. It was originally called made for iPod when the 30 pin dock connector debuted on the third gen iPod in 2003. Fun trivia for you. Anyway, MFI certification is stringent and it's required for all third party hardware that use AirPlay, CarPlay, GymKit, HomeKit, and yes, lightning. What's the cost for third-party accessory makers, you ask? Well, for Lightning, it's four bucks per device. That's right, every time you buy an MFI certified Lightning accessory, be that a speaker dock or a Lightning cable, four bucks goes straight to Apple. As you can imagine, this generates an extraordinary amount of income for Apple that they most certainly do not want to give up by moving to USB-C, especially considering that the iPhone accessory market is a multi-billion dollar industry. But there's another big problem, and that's Europe. What else is new? <laughs> Just kidding, I love you guys, you're awesome. Apple lobbied against it earlier this year, but in January of 2020, the EU established new rules to create a common charger for all mobile devices, which would in theory no longer require people to purchase new chargers once they get a new device. Now, the EU has yet to really implement this. They haven't even specified the certain port that they're going to require yet, but look, it's, it's most certainly going to be USB-C, right? Because it's already widely in use. Which means, in theory, at least in Europe, Apple would be required to sell a USB-C iPhone, something they don't want to do. Hmm, what does one do? Aha, a portless iPhone, one with no connectors, would force people to charge wirelessly. 
And because iPhones support an open standard, Qi, Apple could likely navigate around this EU legislation. However, Apple did not opt to use the open source Qi Consortium's standard for 15 watt wireless charging. They developed their own proprietary solution that just so happens to be backwards compatible with 7.5 watt Qi. Now I'm gonna give Apple the benefit of the doubt here and say that this was due to technological limitations with MagSafe's design. But you know what? It also wouldn't surprise me if Apple was being Apple. And if this was an intentional design to make MFI licensed wireless chargers more desirable than the slower open source Qi ones. And while MagSafe hasn't officially been added to the MFI program, it's all but certain, especially since Belkin, Apple's launch partner for accessories, say that they're licensing the tech from Apple itself. Of course, there are non-cynical reasons as well for a portless iPhone or for MagSafe's existence. The biggest one is space. Though not a ton, you'd be surprised at the internal volume that Lightning takes up. And removing the Lightning port would, say, make room for, I don't know, more battery, which is something that this year's 5G iPhones had to reduce because of the extra silicon that these new power-hungry 5G modems required. Extra battery would be especially noticeable on Apple's smallest iPhone 12 mini, a phone that struggles a little bit in the battery department when compared to its larger brethren, which already struggle compared to last year's LTE iPhones. Besides, a physical port is becoming less frequently used anyways. Uh, what was originally required to set up our phones and sync data through iTunes is now essentially only used for charging. Do you want proof of that? Well, the iPhones, even the latest iPhone 12, is only capable of USB 2 over the lightning connector, even with Apple's new fancy USB-C to lightning cable. See, it says right here in System Profiler. I bet you didn't even know that because guess what? I bet you haven't plugged in your iPhone to your computer in years or maybe ever. Okay, so we don't use lightning pretty much for data at all anymore, but it does serve a couple of important functions that Qi wireless charging just can't. For one, and most obviously, it's a secure mechanism by which we attach a cable to a phone. This actually is a problem that MagSafe largely solves. Additionally, power. Uh, wireless charging is slow. Well, it used to be. MagSafe's 15 watt charging is only just a little bit behind the lightning port's 18 watt capacity anyways. MagSafe also has the potential to enhance value through accessories, though I must admit I'm a little more skeptical now about that than I was at launch. The MagSafe charger is good. I still don't prefer it over a standard wireless charger because it's basically, well, a corded charger and requires some hand gymnastics to remove. It's kind of handy when you're kind of charging in bed, but the lightning connector did that too. But look, it doesn't feel inherently worse when you throw it in, I don't know, say a bag with a battery than a standard lightning plug would. It's a pretty good replacement. So charging is cool, but let's talk other accessories. The cases this year that Apple released also have MagSafe embedded into them, but uh, you never really would probably know. Apple implied that the cases were mostly held in place by magnets during the keynote, uh, but that's simply not true. Their own documentation conflicts with that. The silicon case, just like any other iPhone case before it, well, it hugs the side of the device to say affixed to your phone. There's no magnet magic here. Yeah, I guess there are magnets inside the cases themselves, but they're more so utilized to attach accessories to the case rather than the case to the phone. Oh, and then there's the wallet. <laughs> I don't have the wallet, so I can't speak about it firsthand, but a shocking number of videos show that the wallet really struggles staying attached to the phone because, well, science. <laughs> Let's talk science, shall we? The maximum weight a magnet can hold on a surface varies depending on the direction of the application of force. What does that mean? Okay, hold on with me here. Pulling a magnet off of a surface at a right angle requires way more force than shifting a magnet sideways. Just like it's a lot more difficult to lift up a heavy box than it is to slide it along the ground. Neodymium magnets, which are actually neodymium, iron, and boron, the ones used in MagSafe, have about a 15% holding strength compared to their 100% adhesive force. That is to say that if MagSafe magnets required five pounds of force to pull an accessory off, and I don't know, there are no measurements and I can't figure this out myself, but let's pretend it's five pounds to pull it off. Well, then the shear force is just 0.75 pounds that would separate the magnets. That's not very much. It gets a little bit more complicated though than just neodymium magnet, as the size, geometry, plating material, and magnetization properties influence the strength of the actual magnet. 
The magnets that Apple is using are actually quite high-end. Standard neodymium magnets are grade N42. N stands for the maximum temperature, which is 80 degrees Celsius, and then 42 is a number which represents the maximum energy product of the magnet in a measurement called MGOE. Uh, N52 is the strongest grade available, but it comes at the expense of being significantly more brittle and way more expensive. Apple has elected to use N45 in MagSafe, which is, based on magnet people I talk to, about only 5% less powerful than the highest end N52 magnets, but it's much more durable and nearly half the cost, making it by far the most reasonable option. Apple's magnet geometry, composition, and magnetization are just about best in class. It's hard to do better. And the only way to really increase the magnet's strength would be increasing its surface area and thickness, which in and of itself has diminishing returns. So how do we get these two gosh darn magnets to stick together better? Well, magnet folk I talked to suggested the following, not magnets. The best way Apple could increase the shear force of MagSafe is to assist the magnets with an interface material like rubber. Now, I don't have scientific equipment to measure it, so maybe it's just my cognitive and anecdotal bias, but I asked a couple of people to push the rubber MagSafe puck along both the frosted glass on iPhone 12 Pro and the glossy glass on iPhone 12. Everyone said that the iPhone 12 held better because the rubber and the glossy glass have a higher shear force, ignoring the fact that magnets are even involved. And adding the silicon case to either phone increased this even further. So then what's the solution? Well, Apple just needs to add rubber to the back of pretty much every MagSafe accessory, including the leather wallet case. It would help the magnets leaps and bounds. And honestly, I'm kind of surprised they didn't. Maybe because aesthetics, but come on. In short, MagSafe is really nice, okay? But it's not a reason to go out and buy a new iPhone, just like it wasn't really the reason to go out and buy a new Mac. It's one of those reasons you go, oh, nice, but it's not a game changer at least not yet. Now, that may change as new accessories by third parties get developed and as we head towards the impending doom that is a portless iPhone. But for now, it's neat. Oh, speaking of neat, that reminds me about our sponsor, RavPower. Wireless charging, Qi or MagSafe, Look, it's, it's not really wireless. You still need to get power from your wall. And RavPower's excellent new 65 watt gallium nitride desktop charger, it's totally the way to go. This tiny charger can supply 65 watts of total output to two USB-C PD ports at 65 watts each and two 18 watt USB-A ports as well. Intelligent power allocation features distribute that 65 watts of power to the devices that need it when charging four devices simultaneously. And thanks to gallium nitride tech, the charger isn't just small, but it's efficient, expending less energy as heat than old school silicon-based chargers that you're probably used to using. This is the perfect bedside companion for your phone, tablet, and even laptop, being able to charge a 16-inch MacBook Pro from zero to 100% in just two hours. And it's an excellent option when traveling or on the go as well. Be sure to use my code at checkout in the description and save money on your purchase. I think mine is fantastic and I know you'll love yours too. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you disliked it, well, send it to someone you dislike. Thank you so much for watching, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.